Hey, welcome to another episode of the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. Today you are joined by Sophie Dimelo, who is our co-guest and co-host today, and also Andrew um, Moran, who is kind of in and out today. Bit of audio problems, um, we can't really hear him at the beginning, so I think he's just drifting in and out today and just supervising, making sure that me and Sophie don't say or do anything too stupid. Um, <laughs> today we are joined by a, a Microsoft MVP, um, and that is Anna Wilkes. Wilkes, is that correct? Wilkes, but everyone says Wilkes, so it's fine. Wilkes. <laughs> so that's normally something that we normally say before the podcast, making sure we get it right, but... <laughs> that's <laughs> fine, I'm used to it. I still respond. But Sophie, how are you doing? You are right. Yeah, good, thank you, and uh, nice to be back on. I guess, um, Anna, I'll let you, well, first of all, um, a bit of a new introduction to myself. So I'm now in the Geocom um, merchandise, and I am the new account director of Geocom, but today isn't about me. We want to put the spotlight on Anna. So um, a veteran software and data engineer, uh, absolutely incredible. Anna, do you want to give sort of a brief introduction um, to our audience about who you are, what you do, um, and yeah. Yep, no problem. Um, hi, I'm Anna. Uh, essentially, I am a senior consultant at a company called Advanced Analytics, and I specialise in data engineering, but it's not where my journey began. Um, essentially, I started off, um, actually, um, I wanted to be a photographer when I left school, and I slowly but surely evolved uh, into initially kind of web development and then back-end development, and I absolutely loved um, the data side of things. So I was working with a lot of warehousing, data engineering projects, and I slowly organically kind of grew into a data engineer. I'm working on some really awesome projects. And then essentially um, I was headhunted to come and work at Advancing Analytics um, along with another couple of Microsoft MVPs. Um, and essentially now I'm a consultant, so I go into companies and I help them with their data solutions. So help guide them and work alongside them to actually achieve their, their data dreams. So, um, that's that's me kind of work wise, but then I've also involved with a lot of community stuff. So um, I co-run Data Bristol, which is a local meetup. Um, I spend a lot of time um, working on code clubs, so working on the material and also actually going in and helping as and when I can, kind of work allowing and childcare allowing. So really keen on getting that next generation um, of um, girls and boys into coding and just introducing them to tech and trying to make it not as daunting as it as it can be um, to, to, to young children. So um, we start at age four or five and, and upwards. So it's not just uh, children that would be able to pick up things like Python. It's also just introducing them to things like Scratch Junior um, and just getting that, that mindset going uh, and the ball rolling so that they can actually feel confident that they can can get involved and it's something they can do. No, that's really amazing. Yeah, I've seen that you've been a MVP now for 10 months. Yeah. But like, let's just wind back a little bit. Something like kind of you you said was quite interesting. You was looking to go into photography and um, yeah. and that was your kind of career aspirations then. It's like, what was it that kind of got you into IT? What was, what was what's the story behind that? Yeah, so I um, I left school at 16 um, and I'd studied photography at school and I really, really enjoyed it. But I didn't just want to study photography at college. So I chose to do media studies so I could do photography, but then also start doing a little bit um, of film studies, um, marketing um, and also what they called at the time multimedia. And that's where I kind of got the bug for for wanting to learn HTML and JavaScript. Um, and initially it was just something that I enjoyed. I didn't think initially it was something that was kind of take me down that career path. Um, it was just a really awesome part of the course that I really, really enjoyed. Um, but then when finishing that course and I stepped back and reviewed what I wanted to do, essentially um, I kind of looked at that aspect and, and thought, really, I'd rather go down that route and photography still being an interest and a hobby, but I really enjoyed that that coding side of things. But still, I didn't know exactly what it was I wanted to do. It was just, I'm going to find some sort of course that I can carry on this this part of what I learned in media studies. And so um, that's why I ended up doing visual communications, because I could carry on some of the coding side of stuff, but then also do very creative, um, because it was an, an art course, essentially. So we did very creative stuff and carried on with a little bit of um, 
um, kind of video manipulation and things as well. Um, but as I was on that course and that was a H&D, I was more and more just getting into coding and really, really enjoying it. Um, and I was doing evening courses as well because I'm a nerd. And so I did evening courses in like Java and JavaScript and stuff um, at Coventry University. And it just grew and grew to the point where rather than getting a degree in visual communications, I walked away with my H&D um, and changed courses to do a multimedia computing and business degree. So I went in at like level two um, on that course and essentially it just escalated even more from there. Um, and I remember the day I asked one of the tutors, oh, what do you get paid for coding versus what you get paid for being creative? And they were like, oh no, you get paid way more if you can code versus if you're a web, um, designer versus a web developer and that was that light bulb moment and I knew at that point because I was getting on so well with the coding and others in the, the course weren't but they were still academic they were just talented in other areas I kind of realized that that was one of my strengths so um, yeah so from there when I finished that course I essentially um, was looking for a part-time job, something to do whilst I found um, like a graduate role. Um, and I saw in the newspaper a job advertised for somebody that could do XML, um, like JavaScript, HTML. And I was like, wait, I did all of that on my course. I'm just going to send my CV in and not expect to hear a thing. And they got back to me and I got that role and I stayed there for, for a couple of years and I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I couldn't believe at that point that I was sitting there every day, just getting to write code all day and, and work with those those languages that um, are markup languages that I was just playing around with at university. And essentially, it just at that point, um, you know, I would got that foot through the door and I was able to just keep going um, and, and start working change roles, start working more and more as a, like a back-end developer, then a software developer, and then getting more into data and eventually being a data engineer and a, a data consultant. So I think it's not necessarily a conventional route. Um, and a lot of it was just down to confidence and realizing that it was a skill that I had um, and something I was passionate about. And I think that really does affect women um, in tech um, is we don't have the confidence to think that we can do it, especially if it's a male dominated industry, we kind of naturally kind of take a step away initially. Um, and I'm really, um, really all about trying to promote more women in tech. And so I'm involved with, um, so like, Bristol Women's Tech Hub um, I'm heavily involved with. I'm going to be there tomorrow at their careers fair and conference. Um, essentially, I'll be speaking there um, about my role and what I do and again, how I got into what I do and really promoting that and trying to encourage more people and more women, more diversity into, into tech and into data. I find that really interesting and I can resonate with a lot of what, what you have said mm -hmm. um, and especially with you doing media which in my eyes isn't stereotypically technical mm -hmm. however for them to implement coding and programming into the course we, we speak to a lot of women and they say oh you know I fell into tech I fell into uh, the role yeah. that I'm in now but but would you say having that especially on your course did help you find your passion and found you know it allowed you to be more confident knowing mm -hmm. that you've done it and, and progress it even more like what you said you did after um university courses and whatever else um i just think that's that's a really good opportunity and it, it's good for people to know that as well yeah yeah you Do wouldn't you... naturally assume something like media studies would no. lead you down this path at all but it was a good course because it it touched on so many different areas that it gave you just that little taster that you could then say actually this is this is my area this is what i'm passionate about and then start taking that that further so when you choose a university course for example you can actually specialize at that point yeah I, th I think it's absolutely amazing and it's the first i've heard of that as well um and, and you said you've got co-clubs for you know younger the younger generation and getting them into programming and coding hmm. i guess how how are you finding that and and would you say it is you know it's quite successful in the sense of getting both younger girls and boys together to be able to do that um, so the co-club that we run is at a local library, so it mainly um, we get children from the local school, but we, we would like to widen that further. And essentially, at the moment, the children are mostly aged, kind of aged five to seven, so they don't really have a preconception of what working in tech is. Yeah. And that's really, really lovely that they come in and they don't have an image in their mind of what of somebody who works in tech. They're completely a blank canvas and you start teaching them code 
and then you're you're essentially teaching them as an individual not as a stereotype and so essentially they just take it on board and they think yeah well, I can code I can do this and then they're enthusiastic um, we have some that are enthusiastic then about kind of taking it further and so there are other code clubs around Bristol for older children that they could then join essentially yeah I, I guess um I've been sort of doing a little bit more around sort of STEM and, and everything like that. And, and they do say that people don't really see a role model within tech. You know, like if you ask someone, they don't really know a famous person who's a woman in tech. And I think the yeah. fact that you're doing this prior where they don't have a preconception, they're not really thinking about it, is mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. fingers crossed these girls will go on to, to end up working in the tech industry. Not that yeah. I'm trying to morph them in any way, <laughs> um, no, but we do, have, we do have at the minute a 50-50 split. So it's um, kind of five girls, five boys most most of the time, and we have two groups. So that is amazing because normally it, it literally it will be like eight boys, two girls. So yeah. it is is amazing we've got that split, and they are equally enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, so so what would you say drives you within the tech community for you to be able to do all this? Um, for me, um, I have had a lot of support. So I have gone to um, a variety of conferences where um, you get those those key people there who are are kind of uplifting you and and incorporating you as part of the community and making you feel welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really important. Um, and it's it's kind of how I've ended up becoming an MVP because a lot of the people supporting me were MVPs. Um, and so when I'd go and ask them questions and ask them for advice, they were always really open. And um, they'd, if I messaged them outside of the conference, for example, I'd always get a helpful response, even though they'd be super busy and, you know, got a lot on their plate. Um, having that community feel and that inclusive feel is really, really important, especially as a woman in tech. Because again, if you go to a conference, um, you tend to be surrounded by a lot of men. Um, so it's nice that you you have that inclus inclusive environment. And I, I just find that, especially with Microsoft MVPs, that they are very inclusive and trying to, to encourage you as much as possible to be part of the community. And so off the back of that, that's where um, I started to become more part of the community and I started public speaking despite being quite a quiet person myself and quite um, introverted naturally I started public speaking because I had that encouragement and I had people around me saying you should get up and speak about you know the things that you're passionate about because when you start talking about them people do stop and listen because um, I've got this enthusiasm that I then just want to share with everyone and want to just go on and on about data and like star schemas and things and um, apparently it can be quite infectious so um, having those people around me kind of pushing me and helping me and then when I was putting together my first set you know set of slides for my first ever presentation there were people around me who were helping me saying yeah come and practice on us we don't mind we're impartial we'll just we'll We'll be um, we'll be honest, but in a nice way, and give you some tips, and and that was amazing, um, and it's really really helped me, and I I hope it's something that I'll be able to kind of pass on to others who who want to get more into public speaking, and I hope it has internally with the company that I work at. There's a few that have started public speaking, and I hope um, that some of at least some of my input has helped them to feel like they can do it. And what do so, you say for you all see? Oh, I'll say before I let me jump in, John. I say one thing you will see, obviously, I know that obviously you've only been MVP for a, a short period of time. Um, so you haven't actually been to like any of the, the regional events that you know Claire Smith puts mm. on. But what you will see when you do actually get to go to them is obviously yeah, everyone is very much, as you say, you know, very supportive and you'll basically get to meet other MP MVPs from different categories and they say just build that network of you know different people from obviously different walks of life and, and it is refreshing I mean I've been to a couple in the past and mm -hmm. they've been held at all different types of venues and it's, like, it's just nice to actually just kind of have an impartial conversation with someone that you probably would never ever speak to um, face yeah. to face especially if they are you know a woman in tech or you know from a diverse background and just, you know, just build that relationship. I can't wait for the MVP um, conference to be back in person. It was all online. Um, Did you do the, the online one? Yeah. 
yeah, it was, it was good. It was just not the same as Meet It's a bit of a slog, the online one, isn't it? Because, I mean, I've, I've never done the online one. I mean, I, I went to in person and, yeah, it was, you know, an amazing week out in Seattle. Um, networking, I mean, MVPs that I've spoke to for, like, years um, over Twitter and emails of that and actually physically meeting face-to-face, you know, it was the, the biggest thing for me. That's just creating that, you know, that proper network. And there's, there's, there's quite a few guys that... Um, I met over there that I still keep in touch with today, even though I'm not part of the program myself anymore. Um, but it's just nice to have a conversation. So, like you, you said, you you said you you run your local code clubs and stuff like that. But like, how would you kind of like recommend getting like more? Um, so that for the parent at home, what would mm-hmm. you recommend the parent at home to kind of like invest in to kind of help children that might actually be wanting to get into coding or just just for an extra curricular extra curricular that's not easy for me to say learning activity <laughs> they i mean as an individual if they're asking about their child there's lots of material i can point them towards um so i can mention scratch junior and scratch there's lots of stuff out there um that that you can put in front of them and essentially encourage them to start learning i think it's really key though to put these children in front of or put these people in front of the children who want to encourage them to be in tech so um getting getting us in front of um in, this is why i'm a stem ambassador as well to be able to actually go into schools and and go to different groups and actually speak to children directly and encourage them because if you if you tell your child oh you should get more involved in tech there's those preconceptions and they're not not necessarily gonna take you seriously and think oh yeah yeah I'll, I'll do that unless it's unless it's something um that that they already think that they could do and so for me i think rather than the parent um asking me i think it's more that people like myself need to go into yeah. the schools and and get in front of these children and take ourselves to them and so then they can get that that kind of light bulb moment that actually, yeah, I can do this. This is something that I could do, or this is just something I can play around with, like I did originally, um, before it then becomes an actual career when they're a lot older. Um, and I do find coming from a diverse background um, that people from um, unconventional backgrounds don't definitely, not just women, they just definitely don't necessarily think that they can do it. Um, and so they they just uh, kind of turn their back on it. They walk away from it thinking, no, that's not not me. And it's just not true at all. We really, really need more diversity in the tech industry, not just to tick the box, but to uh, to be able to have diverse teams. And if you've got diverse teams, you get better products. It is it is proven. So. Um, so what made what made you kind of you think obviously you you you're from. Um, that background and and yeah. you kind of you've um you started doing a bit of coding what actually kind of like made you kind of go past that self kind of like critique i guess or i, well, I can't do it what made you actually go yeah i can do it what was what was what broke the camel's back as such it was the moment when i was at university and i sat surrounded by really smart people um but they weren't all um as good as me at coding and I'm not saying that I was like the best in the room or anything but it was literally a case of um it was obviously something that I was naturally good at and competent at and so when I was looking around at these people who are really smart and obviously going to go on to have great careers I was finding something that I could do um that was my little niche area and so that was that like lightning bulb moment and when i asked that lecturer in the room how much do people actually get paid for doing this versus being creative and it was like oh no you get paid way more if you're a coder and it was that definitely just that lightning bulb moment that actually this is something that i could actually do as a job um and that was that like you said what broke the camel's back it was that moment that was like yeah, actually, this is what I want to do. So even if I was still going to go down the creative side, I wanted to be still more cozy and focus on that strength. And so, um, and that worked out because I got a job uh, pretty much straight away after leaving university because of all the skills that I'd learned. So, um, so yeah, just, just keep working at it. And then what, out of that, what challenges do you feel you kind of face consistently? Or what, or what challenges have you have you had along the way of being a woman in tech and going into coding and maybe being the only female in the room? Um, 
there's definitely been challenges. Um, first off is when you walk into your first job and you're the only girl, that is pretty daunting. Um, and it's it's nice, especially as a woman, it's nice to have people that you can connect with and relate to. And if you're the only girl there, just that first stepping into the industry can be quite a, a big step. I mean, I've got loads of, of male friends through my job. So, I mean, I, I'm totally fine with that, but I see it with other women that just the fact that they don't have kind of a, a network, a, like a, a, a balance of gender balance, essentially in their role, it can be, uh, can put people off. So that's just like first stepping into the industry. But then once you're in the industry, you do get you do get prejudice and you do get like the old comment and things said to you. Um, so I'd be lying if I said that doesn't happen because it does. And so I've been called things like the token girl in the team. Um, and I've had issues when I've gone away on maternity leave and come back. Um, and then uh, kind of someone being promoted over me whilst I was on maternity to leave somebody that I'd initially trained up. Um, you know, the, these things are, are common stories for, for all women working in tech. And there is a statistic that a lot of women leave within the first year of working in tech. And then by the time they're 35 um, and those those two reasons there um, are, 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 are definitely um, kind of contributing to why. So that initial stepping into the industry and just not feeling part of the, the gang. And then um, when you have children, it is a massive thing. And being able to keep up with all the technology and step back into that role, it is difficult. And that's um, definitely down to having really supportive um, employers um, who are going to kind of still nurture your you as an individual and value you as an individual and help you kind of keep up with all the latest tech um, and not treat you as a second class citizen because you now can't work until kind of eight, nine o'clock at night because you've got to be with your child. And I've been there and it is really difficult, but I would say um, don't be too disheartened because there are companies out there that, that do offer you that balance um, and will offer you kind of in-house training and things like that. So I have definitely personally found that when I was in that situation, I just got another job and it, that just sort of initially that solved the problem. And in that new job, they were teaching me loads of new things and um, I was able to do a lot of my learning during the day. And then it, it was less pressure to to be um, feeling like guilty in the evenings for not doing um, additional tech learning and stuff when my daughter was really young. I've grabbed some of that time back now, but <laughs> but when she was little, it was especially difficult. I think because obviously um, we've had COVID now and most contracts are now basically moving to hybrid working. Mm. It also, that, that's a big step in the right direction to enable women that coming off maternity leave to start, you know, gradually work going back into the workplace because they can then obviously still work from home and do yeah. all the mother care that they need to do. Um, around obviously actually doing their jobs at the same time. I think that's one of the one of the, probably the best things that's come out of COVID is obviously hybrid working. Um, and obviously I, I see now there's quite a lot of companies that are basically, as you say, are trying to basically get women back into uh, their careers within IT and back into the workforce. Because, you know, it needs to happen. It can't just be, you know, as it's always been, the woman goes on maternity leave, as you say, something gets promoted above you. And then, you know, you, you're then going to basically then leave because you know you feel undervalued because of that thing that's happened where you've been you know on maternity leave and you know completely and utterly unfair yeah i mean i heard something it wasn't in tech tech industry and i won't kind of give out any much details but um i heard someone going on maternity leave their manager tried to get him off of pre-arranged training because someone that because she's going on maternity leave she might not need it as much as somebody who's going to be there for um, x amount of time even though it's been booked for absolute months so it's just like people out there it's just and 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 that prejudice was a, another female who'd um who, who'd done that as well who's been on maternity leave and stuff like that like that you just don't you just need to kind of help help yourselves out sometimes like it, and then help each other out so it's, it's just t terrible but um one thing i was going to mention was like um the you're obviously a, a mother from what you've said and stuff how do you kind of how do you juggle the community work and being a mum at, at the same time? Um, I've had a really supportive employer um, who kind of get, so for example, when I did a full day workshop at a conference uh, quite recently, uh, my employer let me have time off um, during working hours to plan that full day workshop. Um, and then I just gave the money that I was paid to them and then they gave it to me as a bonus. So that's, 
uh, having a supportive employer who want you to be in the community um, is one thing because when you you're offered an opportunity like that and you feel like oh I'm not going to be able to do it because I literally don't have enough time having an employer that's like no we want you to go out there then we want you to be in the community that's um, that's one positive element um, but for for myself um, kind of running co-running a meetup and doing co clubs the co club my daughter can come with me um, so that's not a problem um, and running the meetup it's it's once a month we've had a few events online. And essentially, I've I've got support of my partner with childcare. So uh, essentially, I haven't found it too difficult to be um, to be co. I'm co-organizer, so there's another person that does it as well, and then there's a team, basically a committee as well. So um, there's 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 a group of us working on it. Um, and when it comes to uh, kind of public speaking conferences, they tend to be during the day, um, so that's not a problem. Um, I can arrange childcare around that and if it's things in the evening um, again I've got my partner who supports me so um, I guess what I'm saying is having that support network not just in work but in your personal life has enabled me to to be able to be out there in the community um, I still feel guilty sometimes that I'm not doing as much as I want to do um, but sounds like um, you're in love <laughs> sounds like you're doing really well um, but but yeah, for me, and this is just a personal um, a personal journey. It's it's been a supportive employer, um, a supportive partner, uh, and family that have helped me uh, essentially um, be in the community. Um, and my partner is really keen on me being kind of like a female uh, voice in the tech community, even though his job is nothing to do with tech. But um, we've been together a long time, and I've come home with lots of stories of of things, ways I've been treated as a woman in tech. And he's really keen on me actually um, kind of promoting myself um, and overcoming um, those hurdles. So, which is really awesome. And I'm really lucky. Yeah, I love that. I think the main thing as well, what you've sort of got from that is having that support. And I think it's so important that businesses now understand that you know there's been a lot of <clears throat> people who have said why is women in tech even a thing and you know why is it a topic I don't see any problem with it um, but just you know sharing your story your story and your experiences and being able to have that support and be as successful as you as you have been um is, is the whole reason why it should be um and why you know it does need to be spoke about um so outside of everything else that you do um describe your usual working day so what is it that you would do okay so in my current role I'm a consultant so I do spend a lot of time talking to clients um, so I will uh, spend a lot of time on calls so I work from home which is amazing because um, I've got that life balance um, I spend a lot of time on calls essentially um, working directly with clients so whether that's guiding them through processes how could helping them architect um, going away and writing um, code for them and then taking them through that so designing say um, ETL pipelines because I work with data um, so then I'm constantly um, essentially I, I do have a lot of time around my I could sit and just code um, but because I'm a consultant I also spend a lot of time working with the clients and and just helping them um, which I love because I like passing on my knowledge um, as you probably gathered <laughs> So I like I like sharing my enthusiasm and so that's why I think being a consultant is really suiting me um, even though you get challenging moments uh, essentially I like the fact that I'm not just behind a screen all day typing away writing code which I have been in previous roles I'm actually talking to people I'm actually interacting um, enough say so that I'm not at the end of the day exhausted from just talking all day um, but um, yeah it's, it's that it's a nice balance so that at the moment is my my current role. So that's what I I do, um, but it, it's very different to previous roles that I've done. Yeah. How have you found the transition? Because, you know, normally again stereotypically, if you're doing coding or program or whatever, you are sort of behind the scenes mm -hmm. and you're not you're not very customer facing. So when this role came about, you know, yeah. how did you feel and how have you transition, transitioned into it? Well, um, in a previous role. Um, I was leading a data science project where I was um, talking to everyone in the business and the company um, and uh, working uh, with people at Microsoft as well. And so for me, and I've 
in a previous life I have as a part-time role worked in sales as well so I'm quite used to um, having to to be talking all day and and uh, kind of keeping that that um, happy smiley face going um, which is fine because I'm a happy person um, but I say for me it wasn't it wasn't too difficult it was a little bit daunting um, that I'm that I'm that point that they come to me for the advice and say so that can be a little bit daunting but then because I'm in a really supportive company and there's always somebody that knows the answer if I don't know the answer to a question it's easy for me to say right I don't know but I know someone that probably will um, or I can go away and do some digging and find out for you and say so, um, getting over that that hurdle um, of what if they ask me a question that I can't answer yes that was daunting but I feel now like I've I've overcome it and I'm I'm really enjoying getting to speak to people um, a lot of the time and not just being behind my screen coding because I do go a little bit insane if I don't have someone to talk to you. <laughs> so. I think that's it and with working from home as well you know some people might go days without speaking to anyone hopefully not but um, yeah. I think especially with being a consultant it is important as well to if you don't know something say you know I don't know I'll go back yeah. and uh, someone else um, will, you know, find that out for you. Um, so, who who has inspired? You said you've had a lot of support, but who has inspired you within within the community? So, um, initially, um, I was inspired by um, two MVPs, um, Simon Whiteley and Terry McCann, just because they were so incredibly supportive to the point where like, Simon let me use some of his slides to take back to my company and, and use to be able to sell an architecture for, um, a, for a data engineering project. Um, and so um, and when you go to their talks, they're so knowledgeable and so enthusiastic that initially that was those would have been the two people that I would immediately have said. But as I now work for them, um, it isn't a sales pitch uh, for my company. It was literally I think I followed them around so much that they were like, should we just give her a job? <laughs> um, so. Yeah, you basically worked with them anyway. So. <laughs> Um, to be so, fair though, I mean, I've actually got quite a few different jobs by just literally running events and attending events because you basically you build that relationship with people and then obviously yeah. they, they know how driven you are. So it, but the, the only thing I found quite awkward was the actual interview process because the person that was attending my events was then interviewing me. And it's like, okay. <laughs> trying, trying to separate that was a bit weird. It's like, but yeah, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. I mean, I mean, it's happened to me a couple of times. So. If you're out there getting more involved, then people do recognise you, and then obviously go, okay, well, you know, maybe it's worth taking a punt to that person. So, yeah, yeah, it worked out well for me. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome if you if you get yourself out there. Um, it definitely does open doors for you, um, and don't be afraid to ask those very difficult questions, um, even the ones that may think make you feel you you look a bit stupid because it's never a stupid question I always have to tell myself yeah there's um, never a stupid question if you don't know the answer then <laughs> obviously someone will and you know yeah. I've done it before at conferences I've asked a question in an audience it's because you know I want to generally know the answer because I don't actually know I'm not trying to throw them a yeah. curveball because <laughs> you know people people do do that I mean I've had it done to me but um yeah you you know you ask him what you want to know I completely agree with that. So my first public speaking event with you guys, that's why I've got the job now because that's where I met him at South Coast Summit, my boss. So yeah, it's completely, um, you know, I completely resonate with that. And I think, what well, I mean, people wanting to get into the tech community, Anna, and especially women in tech, what, what advice would you give? Um, I think um, for anyone who came to me and said, uh, as a woman, they wanted to get into the tech industry, um, I would point them towards women in tech um, as a support group uh, first off. Um, and then I would definitely point them towards different conferences. Um, the, the conferences that I found supportive and suggest essentially that they go to those. Um, and I, I find with women um, and with working with women in, in tech, women are often quite nervous about going to events. So if somebody came to me asking about getting into tech and they wanted to go to these conferences, but they were unsure, I would definitely do what we call is a buddy system. And I would offer to meet them there and, and actually get them through the door um, because uh, women are renowned for, for not 
turning up because they want to go and then it's like oh it's going to be awful of men and so um having um having those support networks in place like women in tech um and um having as people like myself there to say yeah come and join us be one of us and start pointing them in the right direction um and getting them involved in the community because the more they feel part of a community the more they're going to feel like yeah i want to be part of this industry Whereas if you step into the industry and it's very closed doors um, and you feel like an outsider, that's where we lose women. Um, and it's it's just a case of finding those those people that are going to support you um, rather than um, blind you with lots of uh, tech speak um, to try and make you feel inferior, which <laughs> I've seen happen. Um, and it's, it's just like an ego thing rather than being inclusive. Have you ever, um, or in the future, would you ever consider mentoring yourself? You know, if someone wanted to go for MVP or um, just any sort of mentoring in general? Um, I'm a mentor in my current role. So okay. I, have a, I have a mentee, I have a, a new guy who's, um, who's a fresh graduate. And so I'm helping him through uh, essentially the data engineering journey, which is awesome. Um, I definitely would look at being a mentor outside of my role as well. So if, if, it, if it kind of landed on my lap, I would definitely do it. Um, but I have got a lot going on at the moment, so <laughs> I wouldn't go yeah. at this stage looking for it. Um, but yeah, I do. I definitely um, really enjoy um, encouraging others into into the industry, uh, especially if they're from a, a diverse background. I guess sort of anything you're doing with your with your um, like clubs anyway, you know that is a sense of mentoring, you know, in a sense, but for the future generation. So I think that's I think that's great to be honest. Um, so I guess. So last last question from me then. What what are your future goals? Where do you see see yourself going from here? Um, I feel if because I've been in the industry for quite a long time, um, I've kind of I have achieved um, quite a few goals that I set out for myself. Um, and becoming a consultant was like a big hurdle for me. Um, so that has been really awesome to actually get over that hurdle and be uh, kind of more client facing and getting to work with clients and feeling comfortable with that. So in regards to like a next step, um, I think it's continuing on the path that I'm on becoming I'm a senior consultant, so becoming a more principal consultant um, and essentially just continuing on with my community work. At this stage, I don't have um, I don't have a clear path of where I'm going to go next. But I have um, I have very organically kind of grown into the role that I'm in. So there's not really been um, a massive like set out plan. This is what I'm going to do over the next sort of 10 years. It was it just naturally happened that I ended up going from kind of application developer, software developer, data engineer, data consultant. So hopefully um, it will kind of naturally happen, whatever my next step is. And I'm always open to, to new challenges and um, kind of new uh, career suggestions. So we'll see where it goes. I mean, do you see yourself moving up to like, the level of maybe an, or even an architect? Um, yeah, so I've, I have explored um, being an architect and essentially I've worked in roles where we have so like the software architects uh, and in my current role um, I'm responsible for an in-house um, basically an in-house library that we use with a lot of our clients and I've been referred to there as being more of the, the architect for it so it's definitely something that's been discussed um, it's been discussed with my current employer um, and it's something that I've previously um, looked at as a role from a software engineering point of view and thought, yeah, eventually that would be um, a good place for myself to become just that architect who hovers over um, the projects and just make sure everything is gluing together properly and the right tech is being used in the right place um, and in a way that essentially um, everything as a whole is working as it should do rather than little bubbles of certain software engineers who want to use a certain technology because it's the latest stuff and it's not necessarily what's right for the bigger architecture those sorts of things so um so yeah so definitely um kind of hit the nail on the head it is something that's been discussed but i'll, I'll kind of wait and see if that's where it evolves awesome and so we're probably getting close to um, time. I mean, in the past, I used to ask interview questions at the end, and so I kind of moved away from that. So I'm, I'm now going to throw it to John. He's actually got um, some fun questions to try and end the podcast with. So some like, quick fire questions to see, see how we get on. <laughs> so we've gone through like past, middle, future, right? So we're just going to go quick fire, 
like just to get to know you a little bit more um, in tech and outside of tech. So first one, what's your, what was your favorite? What is your favorite book? What tech book? Any book. Uh, my well, my favorite book is Harry Potter, but that's obvious <laughs> that everyone likes Harry Potter, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, who was your hero growing up? Oh, um, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of something that isn't lame. <laughs> <laughs> um, it won't be lame. Well, I actually, um, when I was like 14, I wanted to be um, an archaeologist. So before the photography, I actually wanted to be an archaeologist. So I used to like watching things like Time Team. And um, so I used to um, really um, aspire to be like them. But then obviously that's evolved into something completely different. So <laughs> what I aspired to when I was a kid is quite different now. I just wanted to go and dig in muddy fields, I think. <laughs> What's your favourite Microsoft OS? Oh, OK. Um, um, I don't really have a preference because um, I use, um, I do use Linux quite a lot. I was going to actually, <laughs> that, let's, let's, let's close that. I was going to put favourite OS, but I had written down Microsoft. So I was like, so what's your favourite OS? <laughs> um, well, you, I use um, Linux quite a lot. Um, for like especially working with like, Docker and things um, and working with like Ubuntu images and and so it really for for my job and for kind of working with things like Docker then I'd go lean towards Linux but obviously like during the day just on my normal laptop day to day I would just naturally go towards uh, Microsoft operating system one but I like Macs as well fair. yeah one XP. <laughs> XP is like the my favorite one like <laughs> Not Vista, yeah. Windows ME. Nah, no, definitely know. not Vista. Like XP, that's like I feel that's the one that I like. I fell in love with computers like at that XP time where okay. like that's so that for me that would, I think that always be my. Favorite. It might not be the best and stuff like that now, but I think for nostalgic purposes, I think XP would always be my my favorite. I remember XP being released. I don't remember it being around the time that .dot net came around as well. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I just remember how, like how .NET was like this shining star um, compared to traditional, just working with classic ASP and JSP um, that we had been learning on our course. So I, I yeah, XP was definitely um, it, was, it was quite a, a cutting edge one compared to what it had been, um, and everyone was kind of singing about it. But then I was more on the .NET is amazing side <laughs> rather than the operating system it was on. So I'm going to change this, this this question slightly. So it was what what's your favorite Microsoft product? I'm going to go for what like product, what program has kind of really helped you and changed kind of like your your life in terms of working. What's really helped you? Um, I like Visual Studio Code, and I, I can tell you why because I um worked with Visual Studio back in the day. And for those who've worked with Visual Studio, it was very heavy and very clunky. And when Visual Studio Code came out, it was, you know, just this lighter version of a, a lighter IDE that you could literally work with that is more cross-platform. Um, and essentially, you can just add in your extensions really easily. Uh, it was just um, such a like a weight off your shoulders to be able to work with Visual Studio Code uh, and all the new kind of extensions and stuff that keep getting added in. Um, I just find it so much easier, um, and especially because I could program in different languages as well. I just I always go to Visual Studio Code as my tool of choice, essentially. Nice. And the last question, I think, kind of like the the creme de la creme question: What's the go-to karaoke song? <laughs> I love the question. <laughs> I've never done karaoke. I've never had the nerve. But if I were to um, to have the nerve to do it, I I would definitely do something like ABBA, because my mum was obsessed growing up, and she, we used to play her records over and over again and dance around the kitchen. To have, have the songs. So. Have that confidence. Have that confidence. What you've got in programming and coding. You know, I, don't, I think even if like you haven't done karaoke in the past, I think everyone has a go like in their head. Yeah, if I was gonna go to do karaoke and absolutely smash it. This would be it. If I if, if I'd had just enough wines, I'd be. Uh, this is what I'd say. <laughs> cool, that's it. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna throw it there. I actually sang Nelly Furtado. I'm like a bird once because my mates basically <laughs> submitted it to um the DJ and I had to go up and sing it. So yeah, I'm, well, I've done it. Uh, 
a that good song, actually. It's a really good song. <laughs> I don't think Andrew could um, hit those high notes, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, or even then, so, yeah. <laughs> cool. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you, Anna. Um, and, yeah, and it's been an absolutely fantastic guest to the show. Really good to kind of um, get to know you and your career and, and um, everything else. It's been, been fantastic. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. All good to meet you, Anna. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for listening to the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. Please make sure you hit that like, share and subscribe button to help us promote our message. You can also follow us on Twitter at MSFT Spotlight and we're also on LinkedIn, the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. And finally, we'd like to tell you a little bit about BitTitan and thank them for sponsoring this podcast. Remote migrations start here. Let MigrationWiz do the work for you. It's fast, secure and 100% SaaS which means you can migrate at any time and from anywhere. Migrate mailboxes, documents, public folders, personal archives, or even Microsoft Teams with just a few clicks. No special training needed and no customer downtime. When the work matters, choose MigrationWiz.